paradoxes are annoying. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Why am I talking about paradoxes? Well, having now been looking into this whole Flat Earth issue for a good 7-8 months or so by now, I think if I'm honest with myself and honest with whoever might be watching various videos I put out and looking into these things, I think most of us who have been engaged in this whole area of investigation and speculation and scriptural research and the whole nine yards, I think if we're honest about it, we have to admit that there are at least a number of things that we're still at this point struggling to, to put together. And there's still a significant number of, of issues and questions which at the current time definitely just feel like paradoxes, especially when you get into the, the whole map question. And um, I've been recently wrestling with a few myself, um, to be completely honest. Um, just in this, in this last week or so, I was coming across the whole issue of the, the equinox, since we just went through the spring equinox, and, um, and of course the people who are out to debunk the Flat Earth idea altogether are pointing to it as undeniable proof that we live on a globe, and this is the only way that uh, the sun could rise at apparent due east from every every point along the surface of the earth and how you could have 12 hours of, of daylight at every point in the earth and you know I fully understand how this is claimed to operate based on the globe model with with the earth being exactly between each of the solstice points on its alleged solar orbit orbit and all that and to me this is a this is a, a, a significant <laughs> puzzle it's a significant challenge Similarly, uh, I was just watching yesterday a video that Rob Skiba put out talking about the uh, infamous flight from Chile to Australia that dips down and almost even touches Antarctica. And he did this big lengthy piece looking at uh, the Gleason's map and, and sort of examining this idea of the various quadrants on a, an azimuthal equidistant map representing the same distances between each of the lines of longitude, both in the, the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere. And it's an interesting exploration of, of the topic, but um, from where I stand, it really does also start to have some serious problems with it as well, particularly if you if you take that premise and try and apply it to the, the more northerly um, latitudes. You know, the closer you get to the to the North Pole, which our conventional flat Earth maps put at the center and, and allege that the, the sun and the stars are all rotating around. You know, obviously this is going to be a problem because <laughs> just by definition, those dis those distances are going to have to get smaller and smaller as, as you approach that singular point where they all converge. And so, to me, so the bottom line is that, yeah, we still have a number of things that just don't seem to make sense. They don't seem to line up. And really, this isn't anything new. I mean, even from the beginning of looking into the, the whole Flat Earth topic in general, when I was first looking, taking a, a fresh look at the Bible and comparing all these ideas, you know, you're presented with the sort of obvious con seeming contradictions of a, a circular dome-enclosed Flat Earth model, but then somehow you have the existence of the, the four corners and the four pillars. And, and then, of course... You know, and th there's ideas of that those four corners are actually outside the dome, or, you know, I've put out a video exploring the idea of the four cardinal directions, where north, south, east, and west are, in fact, fixed um, fixed directional points, um, which Enoch itself actually seems to describe far more than north being a point in the center, which everything revolves around, and south being um, just sort of an infinite ring around the whole thing. So there's all these really interesting ideas that somehow, you know, we keep coming back to again and again. But, you know, honestly, we we still are struggling to put a lot of these pieces together in a way that makes sense from our, our current perspective, our current point of understanding. So, yeah, in a lot of ways, it feels like you're just sitting in the middle of uh, a big paradox. Because at the same time, as I've been looking into this stuff now intently for months, um, you know, when I came into it, I was already convinced that the, the Apollo moon landings were were a hoax and you know that was I already had that under my belt so to speak but 
But then as you start to look at everything that NASA and all the other space agencies have put out since their inception, so I've never been more convinced that nobody's ever been to space or that even space, that we have sufficient evidence to believe that space exists. And, you know, I've looked, I've been looking into all these historical uh, progressions of heliocentrism and Copernicanism, and the Copernican principle, and, and all these things, and so many of the, the pieces just fit together so perfectly, it just continues to point you in this direction, that it was all a necessary component of not just evolutionary cosmology, but um, a necessary foundation for the whole idea of you know, the whole ancient aliens idea and alien deception and the UFO meme and, and on and on and on. But then, of course, the critics always bring you back to this point of what's the real model? What's what? What are we on? How does it work? Explain the stars. Explain this. Explain that. You know, they, everyone wants to see the model. You know, like Tiger Dan was saying, if you don't have a map, you don't have an argument. You don't have proof. And um, and that's always the big push. We're always being pushed to you know to solve it, to figure it out, and to you know if you can't answer all these seemingly contradictory and paradoxical questions, because like I said, not just the you. I've never been more convinced that that everything about space we. I've never been more convinced that everything we've been shown about space is fabricated and it's just an all-out hoax. And at the same time, when we look at all these curvature experiments uh, we don't find evidence of curvature so if there's no curve you have a plane you know it's, pr it's pretty simple so but then you know we gotta then everyone's trying to solve s solve all these questions like the question of 24-hour daylight in the Antarctica and solve the, the southern pole stars and solve all these you know predominantly celestial questions, you know, trying to understand what the heavens are and how it all works. And and typically we're trying to do this again within, we're still adhering to the Copernican principle, even though we don't even, I think, consciously recognize we are in terms of explaining it all in terms of physical, materialistic um, forces and mechanics. When I think since the beginning, I've kind of really been, been forcing myself to re-examine those kinds of assumptions and especially from a biblical point of view. Um, you know, we look at all the connections between uh, the, the angels and the stars and the heavens, and you're thinking of these things now of a heavenly realm or of dimensional capacities that we maybe don't even have the the lexicon to, to describe or the, the dimensional models to really even try and put it together. I think, you know, the more you get in, it just starts to break down because you're not just dealing with a, a purely three-dimensional time-space framework so what are we on you know so 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 what do we do where do we go I mean you can have a meltdown and you know start calling everyone a liar or you can just quietly kind of slip away and, and just get frustrated with it and that's something that I think I've seen a lot of people do even if they haven't openly said a word about it um, there's just been a number of people who were coming around you know six months ago three months ago and suddenly I'm not I'm not seeing them and I'm not hearing from them and makes me wonder, and I think this is a, a much more common thing, is that people just, I think, get burned out on it and um, get frustrated and, you know, they start hitting these these roadblocks and these, these paradoxes and either they conclude quietly that, well, maybe we, we really are just on a globe and we're in space and the whole thing must be crazy and I feel silly for even looking into it. Well, they're just not sure and they don't know what to think and kind of just need to get on with life and not obsess about it and I can fully appreciate that feeling. But it's the kind of thing where once you've you know, you've seen enough to where it's I don't know about other people, but I'm the kind of person to where once I've seen I've seen too much to just walk away completely to to, to just not to not know that they're they're lying a great deal about the cosmology and the earth and the stars and the nature of the earth and we know what the Bible says we know what the Book of Enoch says and we know that they are vastly different <laughs> we know that. Uh, the, the space race, these space programs are a, a unified hoax, which I know is just so difficult for, for many people to wrap their heads around. For, for me, that's one of the easier pieces. It always has been. But I think, like a lot of us, we then where we get hung up on is how does it work? You know, how do, we, how do we explain it? How do we make the model? How do we build the model? And you just... And we keep coming back to these, these types of paradoxes. And, and I myself even lately started wondering... And recently, I just keep 
almost coming to the place of, of wondering what fundamental assumption are we still making? What piece of the puzzle are we still missing? What are we still injecting into this whole thing that really we, sh we should go back and reconsider? You know, and I don't know if it is this idea of the North Pole being at the center. You know, a lot of people wonder about, well, what if Jerusalem was the center? And, and that was something I've wondered about since the beginning. Um, but then it's like hard to it, it's hard to reconcile that concept with the idea of the of either one or two poles. Like there's there's a magnetic pole. We know that. Why shouldn't that logically be the center? And you know, P Polaris, the North Star, being above the North Pole, and shouldn't that mean that that's the center? And and again, I think you start driving yourself crazy, going like all these. There's something about all these maps that are wrong, but then. You know, part of me wonders: Are they are they all wrong, but all right in a, in a way? Are they all projections of something that we haven't even considered yet? And it just starts to sound kind of, I think, yeah, a different level of crazy. But something too that stuck out to me from the almost the very beginning, when you're on the one hand looking at all these pieces of possible flat Earth concepts that have to do with you know circles, whether it's the the circular Earth under a dome. And then the, the circuits of the luminaries are going around to central point, and so you have all these circular aspects, and then you also have these square aspects of four four pillars of you know pillars and four corners, and um, you know the four winds, and so it's always like it's it's this whole sort of underlying paradox of the the circular aspects versus the square aspects, right? And interestingly enough, you know that's one of the the central little esoteric riddles embedded within Freemasonry, even in their logo themselves, which of course we can look at and see is, is of course an adaptation of the six-pointed star, but the way they render it is with a square and a compass. And obviously, you know, a compass is used to draw a circle and a square is used to draw squares. So even in their logo, their main logo that they stick on everything is embedded symbolism for the whole occult riddle of squaring the circle. And this is something that to me, it would make a lot of sense if this this whole issue of squaring the circle revolves around this this esoteric symbolism is has something something to do with solving these these types of cosmological paradoxes. But anyhow, my point in even breaking all that up is not to even remotely suggest that that's the kinds of things that we need to start looking into ourselves. But even if we're embracing a zetetic you know, a zetetic ideology or or approach to science, but at the same time, I think it has to be tempered with, at the end of the day, remembering that we are finite, that we are even fallen even, and that until we are resurrected and redeemed and, and see as it really is, there's going to be paradoxes, and, you know, are you going to be okay with that? Can you live with that? And that's, and see, when you can contrast that with with science, or with what, you know, as we look at it as scientism, this religion of science. Science turned into this humanistic endeavor, which that basically rejects that. It rejects the idea that there's nothing that we can't ever someday figure out, that we can't ever know, that we can't ever solve, that we can't ever master and comprehend and put into an equation. And that's why I think scientism, materialistic scientism, inevitably, over time, even over generations, but inevitably pushes people into metaphysical, mystical, occult arenas, because because it has to. And, I don't know, at the end of the day, I guess, I, so I guess right now I'm just thinking about the verse that says, to paraphrase, right now we know in part, we see in part and we know in part, but, but then we will know just as we are fully known. So, don't lose heart, don't get, don't get down, don't get discouraged, but um, just continue to question, continue to, to ponder, but also continue to, but I think, we always have to remember that unless we keep God and His Word as the true source of knowledge, that we're in danger of being led off towards towards a human-centered pursuit of knowledge, and uh, you know that that never ends well. So, all right, peace.